Uh, he was born and raised in Philadelphia, attended Philadelphia public schools, and during that time also studied uh, classical violin uh, here with the redoubtable uh, Edgar Ortmer, who was a, an imposing gentleman, and in fact John told me one time that uh, it took him a long time to get up the courage to tell uh, Mr. Ortenberg that, that he was playing jazz on the violin. <laughs> Um, but uh, be that as it may, uh, it certainly helped to inform his early career and uh, the, the fabulous technique that he has as a violinist. He went on to study at uh, uh, West Virginia University and then in Switzerland in Montreux um, and started playing uh, with uh, Grover Washington in the mid-70s. And then since then, uh, three times uh, he was chosen as one of the top two jazz violinists in the uh, uh, downbeat poll. And uh, he's got wonderful stories to tell today and also is here to talk uh, with you about music and leadership, Mr. John Blake Jr. Even though many of you have, in that situation, have suffered abuse 
who have been taken advantage of still. Is that what you want to do? Or do you want to present something better for your family and for your friends and make the world a better place? This uh, um, 2009, I got a chance to go to Africa. I went to Uganda, Zambia, and Ethiopia. Basically, it was a mission to uh, bring attention to the AIDS virus in, uh, in those regions where a lot of young people are uh, were homeless and also have been orphans because they lost their parents to the virus. So this is my first time actually uh, in the kind of region I went to, people still have to walk to get water. And also there was no electricity. But the thing that struck me most in seeing that, seeing how even though the people had nothing, they had a sense of spirituality amongst themselves to take care of one another. If someone didn't have something, the neighbor tried to help. So uh, I also visited the slave castles in Ghana, and I got a chance to see how horrible conditions were for people who were on, undergoing the slavery, who never even made it off the, on the coast. But it brought to a lot of things to my mind. One is uh, standing up for what's right, uh, and also humanity, really caring that whatever happens to me, it's not just me that it can affect the whole world, and also that there are other people who are suffering. And that as humans, we need to uh, be concerned with not just ourselves, but the whole world, because if one person is slave over there, that can affect us one day, it might be us. So I'm pointing out those kind of things because one of the things that was very good about coming to Selden was that the people that I met here were very much, uh, I never had the feeling that I was talked down to or that I couldn't achieve anything that I wanted to do. We were all encouraged, whether you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever you were, you were, you were encouraged to do your best. So I want to bring back a few ideas that I talked to my siblings, who we had a family of five, three, three boys and two girls. So I talked to my sisters about what their experience was uh, when they were coming up here. So, so I talked to my older sister first. She was a voice major, and she studied with uh, a woman at that time named Ilya Koretny. And she said that Ms. Koretny was only not only just a great teacher, but she treated her like a daughter. And uh, she never uh, she she never felt that she was uh, her, her teacher was very patient, and she never felt that she was being talked down to. And during that time, when I came up, this is during the uh, 60s. You ever heard about the 60s? Well, it was a very interesting time. Because at this time, uh, particularly uh, African Americans were going through great struggle in the South in terms of uh, equal rights, schools, everything was segregated. So there was a man uh, who became prominent in slavery by the name of uh, Martin Luther King. You heard him before? I'm just checking, because I had, I had my mind going a little bit, because I was, I was talking to Eric Anderson about some of the people that I remember, and uh, he didn't remember anybody that I mentioned, because most of those people are gone. So it just sort of put me in perspective in terms of how old I am now. And, um, uh, so the people that we met here were very kind to us. We didn't feel at all um, prejudiced. We were encouraged. As a matter of fact, sometimes my father and all of us were on scholarship to take lessons because it was just uh, too expensive for my father to afford to, to pay full price for everybody in my family. It was just too much. So often we would 
the settlement to provide some little jobs for us to do to help pay for the lessons. Like, I remember my sister used to work in the office with a woman named Miss Conan. And a lot of times it was really at that time they didn't have the computers that, you know, some can, you know, print out the letter, uh, I'll put it in envelope, and everything's sent right out. Well, back then, people used to have to lick the, uh, the envelope and seal it. So that was my daughter's, that's my sister's job. She would come in. And one time when she came in, Miss, Miss Conan said, uh, are you going to the march? Are you going, are you going to Washington? And uh, my sister said, no, but Miss Conan at that time was going to Washington to march for civil rights. This is in 1963. All right, and this my sister just walked in right now. What, what, what year was that? 63. 63, okay. So uh, we, had, we had people who were very interesting characters, people who were just dynamic people. We had the director there at that time was a man named Saul Schoenbach. And Saul Schoenbach at that time was the principal bassoonist for the Philadelphia Orchestra. But to us, he was more than just the bassoonist. He cared about the students here. He did all kinds of things outside of the uh, realm of bassoonists as just as a human being to encourage students. We always, and, and particularly again, I'm coming back to the fact that during that time, the race issue in the country was pretty, pretty serious. There's a lot of heavy stuff going on. The people who, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, uh, philosophy was not violent. And it was much that came from another great man from another country named Mahatma Gandhi, who uh, led his people without being violent. Uh, resistance, but without being violent. So the, the people that we met here had, I don't know whether they got, I'm not sure how they screened the workers that come here and teach as teachers, whether they asked them all kinds of questions about their belief system. I don't know how they did it, but they had a lot of people here who were teachers who were just great people. And again, go back to uh, my trip to the prisons and other places where I, you know, I ask people, who do you want to be? So it's, it's great to have a great talent, uh, but talent, a lot of people have great talent. But you can have great talent and be a complete jerk. That doesn't mean that you're a great person because you have talent. There's something more than that that makes you more human and more loved. You know, when I think about people who were the first in uh, the first base, African American baseball player, the first Africans that were African Americans that were involved in opera, like Baron Anderson, it took great courage at that time. You just, it just wasn't about talent. You had to have character. You had to have a way of being so that people looked up to you not just as a great musician or a great violinist, but looked at you in a way that they see the kind of character you are that actually helps to shape who you might be. When you see one this, a person display character or try to perform a work and being booed at or being mistreated in a certain way, it takes a certain character to be able to withstand that and still perform. So, uh, you know, one of the things I've learned is that life is a struggle. A lot of times you see on TV as far as people fall in love and they live happy ever after, it ain't like that. 